In 1973, a British couple took the bold step to live their dreams and embark on an incredible journey. They had plans to navigate the world in their new sailboat. Their eight-month journey was filled with breathtaking moments and awe-inspiring sights as they sailed across vast oceans. And as they sailed towards the Galapagos Islands, they had no clue that their adventure was about to take an unexpected, terrifying turn, and that they would end up in a fight for survival. This is the story of Maurice and Marilyn Bailey. In this story, I'm going to give away the ending right now because it's an incredible tale of survival and determination. And the people in the story, they live to tell the tale of their dream that turned into an absolute nightmare. And all of the information that I'm sharing with you today comes directly from them. At the time, it was the longest that anyone had been lost at sea and then rescued. So let's look back into the 1960s. It was a young couple, they were living in England and feeling a little bit dissatisfied with boring day-to-day -day life. They went to their jobs, they came home, they did the regular domestic life that so many people do, but they felt life was just getting tedious and boring. They were Maurice and Marilyn Bailey. He worked as a printer's clerk and she was a tax officer. Marilyn's love for sailing and exploring mountains ignited Maurice's adventurous spirit. Despite limited funds and a modest domestic life, they were able to still find joy in the outdoors like camping, climbing, and exploring the outdoors. But the desire to escape that city life just became stronger and stronger the more they went on working their dull, dreary jobs. Maurice found city life so unfulfilling that he was trying to convince Marilyn to do something else, something more exciting with their lives. So they sat down, they talked about it, just trying to figure out how they could make it work. What could they do to quit their jobs, yet still survive, but live a more adventurous way of life? Then one evening in 1966, Marilyn proposed a daring plan to sell their house, buy a yacht, and live on board full time. And it didn't take much to convince Maurice. He was totally into it. So they soon found their boat. It was a 9.4 meter yacht, which they named the Orlin. It was a combination of both of their names. They spent months fixing it up and getting it ready to sail. When they finally did, they were able to depart from Southampton, England in June of 1972. They sailed to Spain, Portugal, Madeira, the Canary Islands, and then they crossed the Atlantic Ocean to the Caribbean. And it was a time of great adventure. They were having a blast. They made new friends and met people from lots of other countries who were sailing the same route and who also shared their passion for sailing. After months on the sea, they knew that they made the right decision. Sailing just brought this kind of contentment and tranquility far from the stresses of shore life. They became physically fit and the arthritic pains that Marilyn once had, they totally disappeared. She was feeling great. And eight months later, in February 1973, they reached Panama and prepared for the next leg of their journey, crossing the Pacific Ocean. Their next destination was the Galapagos Islands, about a 10-day passage. So they started off and things were going pretty great until day six. They were off the coast of Guatemala and about 250 miles from the Galapagos Islands. Maurice was getting up early as it was his turn at watch. He barely stirred from bed when he felt this sudden jolt that rocked the boat like a small explosion. They weren't sure what it was at first and then they looked overboard. It was a whale, a gigantic 40 foot sperm whale was thrashing wildly, leaving a trail of blood in the water. It was obviously injured and it just smashed into their boat. Marilyn looked over in panic to see this 18 by 12 inch hole below the waterline and water was rapidly filling the boat. They attempted to stuff all these blankets in the hole and anything they had to just keep the water from coming in, but that didn't work. It was just impossible to stem that flow of water. After 40 minutes of frantic attempts to save the boat, they realized that nothing was working. Both Marilyn and Maurice stood there in disbelief, accepting that they would have to abandon their beloved ship. As Maurice released the life raft they had and a small dinghy that was attached to it, Marilyn started just grabbing all these items from the boat, emergency kit, food, water, as much as they could in a short period of time. With these supplies, they had some food and about 10 gallons of water to sustain them. They estimated that they had about 20 days worth of food and water on board, but with careful rationing, they might be able to make it stretch to 30 days. Oh, and one other minor detail that really comes into play right now is that Marilyn couldn't swim. 
As if their situation wasn't terrifying enough, they had this to worry about as well. Now, those life rafts back in the 70s, they sure aren't what they are today. They were only supposed to really last a few weeks out on the ocean. But they were pretty close to shipping lanes and just assumed that they would soon be picked up and spotted by a passing boat. As they drifted aimlessly in the Pacific, they wondered if anyone would notice their absence. And the only people who might notice that they were delayed were the fellow boaters that they'd recently met. But then again, they had no plans to meet up with them. They kind of all assumed that they'd be in the same area on the Galapagos Islands in about uh, 10 days or so, but nobody really had fixed plans. So the others could have just thought that the Baileys changed their plans and decided to go somewhere else. And no one in England would be expecting to hear from them for another month or two. As they got into the tiny life raft, they realized just how different life is on a sailboat compared to a life raft. The raft was incredibly small with limited space and supplies. They only had a mere 1.3 meters in diameter of internal space. So that is very close quarters. And in their second week, turtles appeared alongside the raft. Marilyn and Maurice were a little bit concerned because these turtles kept rubbing and bumping the bottom of their raft. They were initially excited to see them because who wouldn't be sea turtles in the middle of nowhere? But they realized that the turtles could potentially puncture the floor of the raft, and they didn't want that to happen. That could put them at risk of having a hole in the one thing that was keeping them alive. At first, they just tried pushing the turtles away, but the damn turtles just kept coming back. They were super persistent, and Maurice couldn't figure out why they kept coming back. They just loved to be near the raft. He wasn't sure if it was maybe the shade from the sun or a chance to escape predators. Either way, they were just super annoying. And then they started smacking them on the heads with their paddles just to deter them from damaging the raft and coming closer, but that didn't really even work either. And then on the eighth day, Marilyn was so sick of the turtles, she said, why don't we just catch a turtle and kill it? And then we could have some food, something different from what they've had so far. They didn't have too many tools. They had a blunt stainless steel mariner's knife, a steel pen knife, and kitchen scissors, and that was it. But they caught a turtle and they managed to knock it out first and then they cut through its thick rubbery skin which wasn't easy with their implements that they had but they were able to do it. They drained the thick red blood into a bowl but they found it was too disgusting to drink. They didn't want to have any of it because it was so gross looking and I don't blame them. So they just dumped it into the sea. So when the blood went in the water, it attracted this swarm of fish and it gave Marilyn the idea to use the turtle meat as bait for fishing. Marilyn had these great improvisational skills and she made a makeshift hook from safety pins from their first aid kit. Maurice wasn't really sure that that fishing would work, but Marilyn started baiting the hooks with turtle meat and sure enough, just started pulling in fish after fish after fish. They were so excited and they just gobbled up all the raw fish and they even enjoyed the eyeballs. In fact, that was their favorite part of the fish because they were full of the a liquid that was really satisfying to their thirst. And day eight got even better when they spotted the first ship in the distance. Their hopes totally soared and they were excited. It appeared to be a small fishing boat and they were filled with relief. They thought, eight days at sea, that's been pretty rough, but here we are, we're going to get rescued. Finally, Maurice quickly grabbed some flares that they had and attempted to signal the boat but the first flare malfunctioned and didn't even ignite. They were able to launch a second flare up into the sky and it lit up, and, but there was no indication from the boat that they'd noticed them. So they waited for a little bit and the boat wasn't coming any closer or making any motions that it knew that they were there. The ship then sailed away into the distance. On day 10, they had this incredible moment with a lone sperm whale. It approached their raft slowly with the sound of air being expelled from its blowhole. They were totally mesmerized by its presence. It was so close to them that they could see the blowhole opening and closing. And then it opened again and shot water out of it and onto the raft, like sprinkling them like rain. The massive whale stayed near the raft for about 10 minutes, barely moving. They were just in awe of its size and presence. They became speechless and just were trembling with emotion. Then the whale slowly started to move away and sink below the surface. Going into week three, the harsh conditions were starting to affect them physically. Water was coming into the raft from the sea spray, leaving their lower bodies chafed, sore, and blistered from the salt water. They did their best to mop the water out from the raft, but it was a constant battle to keep dry. Their exhaustion from lack of rest and the prolonged journey 
and working to contain water and catch fish, everything just continued to exhaust them and deepen their depression. Things were really rough three weeks into this. It took almost another three weeks to see the second ship. That's a long time to go between ships. But same thing as the first ship. They shot up some flares and it didn't see them in the distance. Marilyn and Maurice were just devastated and frustrated. They knew that they had to keep pushing and not lose hope. Well, Marilyn's birthday fell on day 51, and if their situation wasn't bad enough, they discovered that day that their dinghy had been punctured by one of their hooks. On top of that, the raft was also slowly leaking. On the dinghy, they found this row of tiny holes, likely from spinefish who have these long spines running down their back. All this physical work that they had to do, even though it was pretty minor, in their weakened state, it was just exhausting to them. As the days went by and they headed into the end of May, two months into this nightmare, Maurice's health was deteriorating fast. He had chest pains and a cough that became really persistent. So they'd try and distract themselves by the pain and the torture by talking about places they wanted to visit. Maurice had a dream for a long time to visit Patagonia a region known for rugged landscapes, natural beauty, and he'd always wanted to go there. But Marilyn wasn't so sure about a trip to Patagonia. <laughs> Some nights on the raft were pretty cold. It would get chilly and they were wet and she just was never comfortable. And she thought in the future, she did not want to be in any cold environment ever. On day 93, the weather took a turn for the worst and they found themselves enduring one of the worst days on the raft. The waves got large and powerful. They posed a serious threat to the stability of the raft. There was heavy clouds that just covered the sky and then the storms came. And Maurice was in the dinghy while Marilyn was in the raft when he saw this massive wave approaching. The wave lifted the raft up and Marilyn felt herself being carried to the top of the wave. She looked down below to see Maurice in the dinghy, but as a wave hit him, he was thrown overboard. But that storm lasted for four days and they lost one container, all their bait and all their fishing gear. And at one point a massive wave of water flowed into the raft causing Marilyn to worry about the possibility of the raft capsizing. But her determination to survive was pretty clear that night when she said, I don't feel like dying, not tonight anyways. <laughs> what a badass Marilyn was. And then came the arrival of the blue-footed booby. So similar to all the other animals that had been around them, they, these birds were super annoying too. And what they did was they would land on the raft and then they would puke all over it. And <laughs> they were worried about them puking into their, into their drinking water and contaminating it. So they smacked this bird that had just puked off the uh, raft with an oar and it went flying into the water. And as it did, it regurgitated four flying fish which it had just eaten. And Maurice and Marilyn, starving as they always were, they grabbed the fish themselves and took them and ate them. And then they decided, hey, these birds could be pretty tasty too. And a nice change from fish and turtles, so they killed one of the birds. And this dark purple sweet flesh of the bird was a nice change from their usual diet. And Marilyn also discovered a new way of fishing. She was cleaning off one of the wings of the birds in the water when she noticed there was fish just jumping right into the wing. So she just started flipping them into the dinghy and that became a new way of fishing for them. So they had tons of fish, birds and turtles now, and they had lots of water from the rain. So they were actually doing okay. Some days they caught over a hundred trigger fish and their average daily catch was an astounding 40 fish. So they were doing okay. But their health was still declining. They were still not getting the nutrition they needed and they were still really thin and getting sicker by the day. And then on June 30th, 117 days into this never-ending ordeal, Maurice rubbed his eyes and peered out. At first he saw nothing but the endless horizon of blue waves, and then he squinted his eyes and saw a glimpse of something in the distance. He looked over at Marilyn and she was way ahead of him. She was already waving her jacket to catch the attention of a ship. And Maurice finally saw this small white ship with rust streaks on its side approaching them from the east. They realized that it was a fishing boat and it was coming closer and closer. After almost four long agonizing months, they couldn't believe it. The ship was here to rescue them. A crew member gave them two glasses of hot steaming milk and they were so happy and relieved to be there. There was happy smiling faces all around them. And Marilyn couldn't hold back her tears of joy and just thanked them profusely between the sips of milk. Maurice and Marilyn looked at each other and he said, we've made it. 
And Marilyn replied, now for Orland II and Patagonia. <laughs> now that's a sign of a true adventurer. Not even five minutes after being rescued, after months at sea and not knowing if they were gonna live or die, they're ready for another adventure. It was a moment that they'd never forget, the moment they were saved from the vast, unforgiving ocean that had been their home for 117 days. So they ended up drifting 2,400 kilometers in the raft until they were rescued. Here's the wild path that the currents and winds took them on their way far away from the Galapagos Islands. Marilyn later said that the animals were their friends and helped them to alleviate their isolation. She also said that after so many months with them, we just felt like sea creatures ourselves. After they arrived home, they became vegetarians and didn't want to kill any more animals. They never ate meat again. And settling back into civilized life, it wasn't easy. Marie said that the sea was our life, the animals were our neighbors. I couldn't believe we were going back to human civilization and we were wondering what civilization has to offer us now. They returned to England and wrote a book of their ordeal a year later called 117 Days Adrift, which is where I got most of this information from. Apparently they did purchase another boat and return to the sea life but in the Orlin too, but I couldn't really find out any more about it or how long they spent on it. Marilyn died of cancer in uh, 2002 at the age of 61, and Maurice died at age 85 in 2019. They just wanted to escape the dullness of life and find some adventure, and that sure is what they found. And I have another video you might like if you haven't seen it yet. It's about a woman who also wanted to try and escape regular life to live a more adventurous life. Her name is Emma Kelty, and she paddled the Amazon River on her own. You can find that link below and on the end screen. So let me know if you'd ever resort to killing turtles and blue-footed boobies to survive. Would you have the will to live after four months adrift in a small, tiny raft with your significant other? Thank you.